I think Ray Pete uh, was a believer that you know CO two can be something that could be um, that could be something that could potentially help combat cancer. Mm-hmm. And cancer is something else that pops up along with glycation. We can get to the glycation in a second, but um, when it comes to when it comes to cancer, a lot of people think that sugar uh, can can be something that like drives cancer or causes cancer. But uh, my understanding is a little different. My understanding is that uh, cancer likes to run off of glucose, right? And it likes to run off of glucose, but that doesn't necessarily mean that can't that uh, cancer is caused from glucose that we're consuming. That a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent correct. Uh, and I would, I would take it, I would say it a little differently. I would say it's not that cancer likes to use glucose. It's that cancer can only use glucose because uh, it can't use oxygen. So it ferments all of the energy because it doesn't have that more complex way of producing energy. So like there's this theory with mitochondria, right? That uh, back when, you know, in the pro- pro- prokaryotic cell stage of development, that uh, the, the mitochondria was a separate organism that got absorbed and then symbiotically we evolved so that we have these, this other organism called a mitochondria in our cells. We would not develop to this level of complexity of an organism if we didn't have the ability to create so much energy through respiration, through that metabolism with oxygen. And so because of that, we've able to create this system that has trillions of cells that all talk to each other and work together and are one coherent organism. If you lose that ability, then those cells are going to start separating from the whole and start treating themselves as as if they're individual and not part of a community. And so that's what's basically happening. It's basically it's the same thing that happens in, in the economy. So if in the economy, if uh, people perceive that times are scarce, they hoard everything and then there's no exchange and then the whole system starts to collapse. But if if they, they feel abundant, they feel safe, then they keep exchanging and they keep trading and then the economy and society stay strong. So it's very similar like that in our body where our cells, they, they need that. Uh, but to me, it's, it's so much more about oxygen and, hypo- and the hypoxic state of the cancer cell than it is about whether it's using glucose or fat or any of those kinds of things. Um, and you asked about CO2. Um, CO2, like, so there's, two effect, there's an effect called the Boron-Haldane effect, which is basically you need to produce CO2 to create an acidic enough environment for the hemoglobin to release the oxygen into the cell so that the, the mitochondria can use it. And so without CO2, we would not have this exchange of oxygen. And that's probably where Pete was coming from when he was saying how CO2 is really important for helping to protect against cancer and things like that. Yeah, he just dropped these bombs sometimes. He was just like, I think CO2 and high altitude. I was like, and I started to look it up and I was like, holy shit, like this guy was amazing. Like he was it's so far really ahead of his time. <laughs> He just like uh, just says it so casually. What about glycation? I don't even really understand what glycation is, but a lot of people keep asking me about that because mm-hmm. um, they think it's caused, you know, just again from dietary sugar. Yeah. So um, again, this is probably similar to the cancer conversation, where it's like technically yes, but that doesn't mean that consuming glucose is bad. Um, so A1C is a measure of glycated hemoglobin. Um, basically what that means, uh, if glucose and protein uh, and um, amino acid hang out together for too long, the uh, glucose attaches to the, to the protein, to the amino acid, and it, that's called glycation. And it, it basically makes it less effective or renders it inactive. Uh, so when uh, glucose is elevated for too long in the bloodstream, it will glycate hemoglobin. And because the blood cell, the red blood cell lasts for 90 days before it's exchanged through bone marrow and through excretion. Uh, we can measure how much glucose was elevated uh, like for a long time above what w- would be considered normal based on the amount of glycation. There's some other factors there involved like uh, antioxidant status and stuff like that because your body has protective mechanisms against, uh, against that hemoglobin being glycated. But this goes back to the conversation before about if you eat a high carb meal and your glucose goes up and then it comes back down, there's not a lot of time in, in that window for hemoglobin to get glycated. The problem is when it stays, what goes up and stays up, or even more importantly, when it's chronically elevated because the liver is constantly pumping out glucose because it can't hear the signal from insulin. It's basically your liver does not know. It can't hear how much glucose is in the blood. So it thinks, oh, we need to keep putting glucose out to keep the organism alive. So your fasting glucose is just raised and raised and raised, even though you don't need it. And so you can be, this is, I've seen carnivore and keto people who have fasting glucose way elevated, even though they're not consuming any carbohydrates at all. That's, that's what's going to cause glycation. 
And that's not to say that you can't have that steak occur while consuming carbs as well. It's just that it's not as simple as carbs equal bad because carbs are involved in glycation or anything like that. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mention, oh, good. I, I oh, said, did. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you did mention, uh, you know, methyl groups. And I was curious as to like, you know, when I think of methyl groups, I think of like, you know, methylated B vitamins and stuff like that. Do you think that that's uh, a critical, I mean, obviously B vitamins are critical period, mm -hmm. uh, but do you think that if you're going to sugar fast and you're going to kind of push the sugar fast and you're maybe only going to be eating meat uh, maybe a couple times a month, do you think that it would be a good idea to potentially supplement with some methylated B vitamins? I uh, absolutely think so. Um, whether it's the methylated B vitamins or uh, betaine and choline, are uh, important methyl donors. I, I especially like betaine because it's a trimethylglycine. That's what betaine is. Um, glycine is, is an ama amazing amino acid, helps with sleep. It's an inhibitory neurotrans or inhibitory amino acid. It's the main amino acid in collagen. Uh, and then the trimethyl, it's three methyl groups that it has the capacity to donate uh, for the, the methylation reactions that we need. Methylated B vitamins are great too as well. But if you have specifically, there's like, I think it's 40% of the population has the under methylation gene mutation. These people 100% need to be taking methyl groups. And part of that is because the higher your fructose intake, the more demand for methyl groups you need. And that has to do with the export of fat from the liver that fructose is involved in. So I think everyone on the sugar diet should be taking betaine, should be taking TMG because this just helps ensure that you're not going to be storing any of the liver, any of the fat that gets trapped in the liver, you're not going to be storing it in the liver, you're going to export it back out. And there's little, literal research showing that TMG reduces fatty liver very potently and very powerfully. So I think this is one thing that's just a protective measure that it's like, I think everyone should be taking betaine. That's huge. Yeah. Um, when it comes to digestive issues, I get a lot of questions about that. Some people just are having like uh, some pretty good amount of bloating. And then, uh, you know, some people are ending up, you know, having to use the bathroom super frequently. I mean, I, I think that happens with almost any diet, but I don't want to dismiss the, uh, you know, the frustrations that people are having. What are some things that people can do to maybe uh, just prevent uh, some of these digestive issues? Yeah, probably uh, the causes could either be ramping up fiber too much. So, um, you know, I recommend fruits and fruit juices and, and honey. But those can have more fiber to them. Obviously, honey and fruit juice wouldn't have as much. But um, those wholesome sources, if you do, uh, if you if you're coming from something that's like carnivore, where you're not really consuming any fiber at all, adding in fiber is going to mess with the digestion. And go slow. Like this is my recommendation for anyone transitioning into this: just go slow. Don't jump straight in because then you're two days in, you're going to feel like crap, and you're going to say this diet doesn't work for me. And it's like, well, you didn't really give it a chance. You you kind of kind of screwed the pooch from the beginning, so to speak. So definitely, you know, let's, let's ramp up the fiber slowly. That could be a big part of it. Second part of it could be fructose malabsorption. And whether that's like a genetic, uh, like, in, like uh, personal to the person who like the, their physiology, or whether it's a situation where you just ramped up fructose too fast. Um, either way, that could be a problem. Same idea, you know, you do a big sugar bomb after being carnivore for five years. It's like your body hasn't had fructose, hasn't had much fructose at all in the past like very long time and then you're just going to dump all this fructose in it's not going to get absorbed very well it'll end up in the microbiome you know the the the, the uh, bacteria will ferment it uh, it's going to cause diarrhea it's going to cause endotoxin it's not going to make you feel very good the um, glute 5 receptor that takes up fructose actually responds to intake so over a couple days it'll the expression of glute 5 which takes up glucose to allow it or i mean a fructose to allow it to to enter into metabolism uh, that requires a like a, a buildup, a ramp up of time in that. Uh, the last area that I would see is maybe just microbiome shifts, right? So like if you wanted to take a, a, pro, a good probiotic, that's probably going to ease the transition. And, uh, you know, because you're eating more fiber, it's just going to actually help help that a little bit more too. What are some considerations that we have towards maybe like hydration? You know, the way I'm looking at this in my head, I'm like, oh, we're just hydrating from the other side now. Like, because... If you do keto or carnivore, a lot of times you're blasting salt, put salt mm -hmm. on your food and so forth to try to keep up with the fact that you're kind of a perpetual dehydrated state because you don't have any, a lot of people aren't eating many carbohydrates when they're doing those diets. So what should be something that we consider? Do we need to consider some sort of balance 
with salt and calcium and so forth to kind of keep everything uh, as healthy as possible? Yeah, so we're definitely consuming more potassium, which can be a good thing, right? Because we're not consuming, most people don't consume enough potassium as it is. Um, but fruits, obviously, very high in potassium. Uh, uh, the refeeds, I think magnesium and calcium, there are some in fruits, but I think like the big refeed meals when you're having uh, your meat and everything, this is why I recommend having the really nutritious sources, um, your starches, your liver, your organ meats, all that's going to supply those nutrients that you need. Um, but the other thing is the reason that sodium is so important on keto or carnivore is that you're not really relying on producing insulin at all. So there's not a lot of insulin signal. Insulin helps your body to retain sodium. And there's actually, I'm sure you know this, there's the, the, um, the keto flu is actually started to, people have been saying that it's actually just sodium uh, fluctuations because you're no longer holding on to sodium, you're peeing it all out. And if you take electrolytes, you can kind of uh, mitigate the symptoms from like the keto flu. But on, on a sugar diet, you are getting a little bit of insulin all day. Fructose, again, does not stimulate insulin, so it doesn't have the same effect, but you're still getting glucose in, in the sucrose molecule. So you are still having um, some insulin effect. Uh, which again, it also matters whether your cells are hearing insulin, because if you have elevated insulin and the cells aren't responding to it, you're not getting the insulin effect, right? So you actually have to be, your cells have to be responding to insulin to get that effect. Um, so because of that, you can salt fruit. If you just add a little salt to your fruit, it actually tastes really, really good. It kind of has like, it's like its own electrolyte combo because it has potassium and it has sodium together. And, you know, I just think that's the best way to go about it. You could take an electrolyte supplement, but also when you do break your sugar fast, that would be de certainly be a time when it's like, okay, make sure you're salting your food adequately and eating to taste and, and all that kind of stuff.